Um, is it possible in the not so distant future that we see unregulated stable coins getting phased out? Um, more specifically still, what does this mean for Tether and USDT, um, you know, which is now the leading stable coin by market cap? Is, is there a possibility that you know, unregulated stable coins are phased out or are they just going to have to get regulated the way USDC has? The intro was Jeremy Allaire, the American technologist who is the CEO and founder of Circle. They issue the USD stablecoin called USDC, and it's second to Tether. Both are pegged to the US dollar at a ratio of one to one. Okay, listen carefully to these comparisons. USD Tether has 114 billion in circulating supply. Its volume in the last 24 hours was 55 billion. And then USDC, 34 billion in circulating supply with the volume in the last 24 hours of 6 billion. I have some thoughts that I'd like to share because there's a lot of focus and talk about stable coins. And I think you'll see why. And of course, yes, there's a new stable coin being introduced by Ripple, the RLUSD. So let's listen to Jeremy's answer to that question in the intro. Will unregulated stable coins get phased out? Keep in mind, Mika rules come out in two phases. Exchanges and wallets are to be effective the 30th of December. I mean, I, I think there's sort of a couple things. It's sort of like, what is the market doing? And then what is, what is the regulatory guidance? And so um, the European Banking Authority, which is the authority over this, issued their explicit guidance on this issue actually in a statement on July 5th, so last Friday. And I, I think they're very clear about like any, anyone who's sort of listing, offering, selling, promoting to the public um, a stable coin that is not MICA conformant, that that is, that is no longer allowed, right? And so I think there's sort of, broadly the industry sort of perceives there to be a time period between now and December 30th where like, either like products are compliant or they're not and sort of you'll see you know products that are like delisted and, and other things over that time i think between now and the end of the year that like that will develop but i think even more importantly over the medium to long term right a lot more players now that you have regulation are going to come into the market i mean so essentially usd tether still has time to decide if the eu is important enough to become compliant and keep in mind there is a cap limits are set to 1 million transactions per day or euro 200 million in trading volume per day. Now listen to the size of this market. It's a huge, huge market, as Jeremy says, and it's going to have tons of competition. What does that mean? Hundreds of stable coins or thousands? It's not hard to fathom the latter. It will come down to adoption, demand, and trust. Do you welcome the competition? Do you welcome uh, new entrants, generally speaking? What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think the fact that we're getting more regulatory clarity is a great thing and will lead to far more you know, companies you know, wanting to compete in the space. The total addressable market for legal electronic money in the world today is over $100 trillion. That's the amount of legal electronic money there is in the world, uh, in, in different currencies, within all of the uh, banking systems globally, right? So you have this huge market of legal electronic money. The total amount of revenue generated from the payment utility on that is over $1.5 trillion. So you're talking about huge, huge markets. The internet has never actually, like the media market, the communications market, like this is a big market, right? So this is absolutely going to attract tons of competition and tons of, of new companies. and big established companies that have big user bases are going to come in and say, hey, there's a lot at stake here. And so we, we definitely, we, we welcome it because of what it says is that like, yeah, this is a, this is a huge global market, right? So I think, you know, if there wasn't competition, there would be, no, there's no, there's, there's not a viable market, right? So, so that's, that's really important. And so we do wel welcome it. And every time one of these launches, I'm the first on Twitter to congratulate them and welcome them to the space because I really mean that. Adoption is the wild card. Sometimes the U.S. jurisdiction can play in its favor and sometimes it won't. USDC also has seen the fastest volume increase in the last year and Solana is one of the key reasons. 
I'm, I, I like to describe myself as an internet maximalist. And so what do I mean by that? I mean, I believe that internet-based systems, open networks, open software, open source code, open protocols, and the continuous innovation cycle of entrepreneurs that are building on that stack is like this force that is growing and, and it's taking on more and more of the kind of infrastructure needs of society. And, and I think that's a very, very powerful force that, that compounds and, and like you see that in ECC right now, right? It's this incredible range of people who are building code, a lot of it open source, contributing to this. The, the, the continuous improvement cycles are, are incredible. And so you don't want to lose that, right? That's so powerful. No government can compete with that. The, it, it's impossible for a government to compete with that. And One thing for sure, on-chain stable coins are going to build a better financial system, less risk, more inclusion, more transparency. And yes, no doubt we are entering the war of stable coins. You're, you're, you're able to have value move with such speed and such velocity that you're able to do that with as safe of an asset as possible. And that's where I think what we think of as DeFi today really comes in, which is if you have a full reserve digital currency, whether it's a euro digital currency, dollar digital currency, and you have on-chain infrastructure for intermediation, you can actually build a, a far more safe and efficient and transparent and well-risk managed intermediation model than the legacy banking system. And so my own view is that like on-chain financial primitives, whether it's you know, uh, borrow, lend, save, invest, swap, exchange, you know, option, you know, future, like all these like primitives that we think of, which we're already seeing, these are on-chain. When you start to build those up and you build those up uh, you know, in, in this infrastructure and, and then financial firms and, and commercial firms and others can start to utilize that, you actually can build, you're, you're basically building a, a, a better financial system from the ground up natively. And, and with inherently, I believe, it can be done in a way which is, has less risk uh, in it and, and, and more transparency and, um, uh, you know, obviously uh, more accessibility and and, uh, and inclusion. So, I mean, those are all the goals, but I, I really think that those are possible, and, and we're, but we're at the very start of that. We're at the very early stages of that right now. So in 10 years, I think we'll be a lot further. And now for some alpha. Yeah, I love this. Could you please give us some alpha? <laughs> so, you know, I, I had a post uh, on X uh, recently where the headline was like, I am more bullish than I've ever been about crypto. And I really am. And I think that that perspective and is, is, is sort of, I've been working on this for 11 years and I've sort of seen not just the 11 years in crypto, but I've seen many, many technology market cycles uh, as well in the internet as a whole dating back to like 1990. So I've sort of seen decades of sort of these cycles of technology adoption, improvement, market activity, et cetera. And like my view is, is when, I, when I sort of try and place at a moment in time, it's, it's oftentimes useful to look at history and sort of say, where are we relative to when the internet was like this or the internet was like that? And, and you know, you see these charts of like crypto and the adoption cycle and it's at 200, 300 million people and it means it's going to explode to billions or whatever. That's probably true. But I think um, it feels to me when I look at the combination of the maturity of blockchain network infrastructure, some of the fundamental primitives that are becoming possible in terms of user experience and abstracting away the complexity of interacting with this technology and the legal certainty that's coming that's really really important when you when you put those those things together it really feels like we're we're we're, we're coming onto that moment where this can really really go to internet scale and so my own view is that um you know, we, we, like 2025 is going to be, like 2024, we're in it. I think it, we're, we're in an improving environment. I think 2025 is going to be a really extraordinary environment. And I'm not focused on prices of crypto assets. I'm focused on how this technology is being built on and used. 
And I think 2025 is going to be a really significant year. And I think we'll, we'll, we'll be, you know, there's lots of uh, these concepts of crossing the chasm, which is an old concept in technology adoption life cycles. And crossing the chasm is like when you go from the early adopter phase to the what's called the early majority. And that's like the steep slope. And so I think we're, we're, we're right now crossing the chasm.